Clark County has been producing rock in some form for the better part of 140 years. Nowadays, things are a little bit different. Uh, surface mining and technology have allowed surface mining to explore areas where the previously, due to the lack of technology, were just untenable. You couldn't get to them, much less mine them safely. Now that those things have been addressed, more area is available for surface mining than wasn't previously. We want to find a way to successfully allow mining enterprise to work in Clark County to the benefit, to the economic benefit and viability of our community. It employs a lot of people, it, it provides a lot of long-term support for families, it keeps people and residents in our area, it keeps families in our area, it reduces outward migration of people, it keeps talent that we've developed here in our schools local, but at the same time, it is also a detriment to the folks that live in those areas and that want to live in an area that has a wonderful rural character and out in these beautiful forested areas where um, Clark County is famous for. I mean, people have been migrating here for that reason for, for 100 years. And it's really, really important to find a way to, to bring those two dynamics together and allow both to peacefully coexist to, to the greatest extent possible. Finding a, a collaborative way to get there without, you know, shooting arrows so much at each other, but just um, but working together to try and resolve this. We're in a place where we have about six mines now that are uh, fully operational at uh, construction grade, and then a total of nine across the county that are producing rock. From 25 down to nine, you can see, or to six really, you can see where the concern comes in because it's not, a, it's not an infinite supply of rock. So we're in a state now where we have to provide the rock that we can to the community and we have to be finding other opportunities to mine the rock that we need for construction. One of the, one of the interesting dynamics in the surface mining activity, the sooner you deplete the mine, the sooner it's reclaimed and the sooner the activity ends. Restrictions have a, an interesting effect on that uh, timeline. Over the years, the, the more you reduce the number of trips, the longer that operational permit has to be extended. In our construct of conditional use permits in the past, for the three active surface mining operations, we have CUPs for, which is, is Daybreak, um, Yakov Mountain, and Livingston. As we revisit CUPs, we will be looking at the time frame, the total time frame, the total impacts over time and the cost, the incremental increases in cost that the county is going to have to bear in road maintenance, in, in monitoring costs. And if we're, we, we, we have to ensure that we continue to diligently provide support, monitoring and enforcement. It always appears to me like that can't be right. There must be something wrong. They're doing something wrong. It came before people understood the CUP or what was it within the CUP that uh, they have to be doing something illegal up there. You know, this can't be going on and these horror stories that I read about, they must be true and these people must be stopped. I don't think anybody understands just how regulated our industry is. And if you could just get into this mining business and do whatever the hell you want, there'd be a lot more people doing it. But it's a tough business, you know? It really is. I, I can't help but kind of laugh at that notion that uh, nobody's watching them. They're doing whatever they want to do because <laughs> I know how many state and uh, local and federal agencies regulate this industry. They do a good job of it. They're there all the time. We report monthly, quarterly, and welcome inspections. You know, we're certainly concerned about the, the placement of mines and, wh and where they would go, what quarries look like, what the, the region looks like in terms of how you place a quarry. At the same time, this is the fastest growing community in the state and perhaps even the Pacific Northwest region. And so you face that difficulty of how you co-locate industrial operations and residential situations, right? 
I think that the fear of the unknown is one of the things that does play into that because rock operations over the years have tended to be seen as something that happens where nobody else can see. But I don't think that the operators really want it to be that way. I think the operators want to be open in terms of you know accessible and transparent and make sure that folks feel comfortable about having a quarry as their neighbor or nearby. At the same time, I think that there is an opportunity for all of us to work together and, and you know, make sure that the realtors know that there's a quarry down the road um, and how that quarry operates and how the concern for the, the neighborhood, concern for the region and the area, concern for the environment, that there is that in place and, and just have those conversations and educate folks. Once people understand that uh, we are following the law, they understand what the CUP says, they have faith that the county is monitoring that on a CUP level, and the Department of Ecology is monitoring our stormwater activity, and Southwest Clean Air is monitoring our air quality issues, and MSHA is monitoring our safety issues inside the pit, LNI is monitoring the blasting that goes on up there, and they're reported to to make sure that we're in compliance with state and local standards. I think a lot of the conversation will shift into, well, what are those people missing? Because they gotta be doing something wrong. Because this can't, this can't be real, but it, it is. And I think if people were to come into the quarry and see our operations, they'd see it's pretty clean. And I'm not boasting, but we are good at what we do. We wouldn't be in the business if we weren't. And so we've, met all the challenges over the years. We've seen them. We've seen how difficult some things are to mitigate. And we wouldn't start the process of permitting unless we knew we could mitigate the potential issues that would come up. Because if you can't mitigate, you can't get permitted to do something. And it'd be, it'd be a waste of resources. And by the time those opportunities to mitigate come in, you can be three, four years into the process and hundreds of thousands, if not over a million bucks invested in getting to that point to find out if you can even mitigate beyond that. I don't want to say trust me, but we wouldn't be in there if we didn't think we could mitigate because you're not going to get away with it. It's just as simple as that. What to you is the best, uh, best case um, outcome? Well, <laughs> As much as I hate to say this, and I really do kind of hate to say it, because I mean, I live here, uh, there's no way we're gonna be able to shut the quarry down. I mean, that ain't gonna happen. They're here and they're, we're just gonna have to deal with it. But we gotta make the best of it on both sides, on their side and on our side. If they would find out, if they would listen to us and make an effort to take care of our issues, that it'd make their life so much easier. We need to get along, that's, that's the bottom line. We, they need to get along with us and we need to get along with them, seeing as how they're here. And the only way to do that is by working together, listening to us, show us that you're wanting to make, that you're wanting to make changes, that you will make changes. The, the problem with the meetings are, is you have the meetings and nothing gets done. Nothing gets done. People sit and it goes in this ear and out that ear. I'm not saying anything bad about the store dolls, I'm just saying that it all boils down to the bottom line because uh, I know there's been issues brought to bow from other people uh, and nothing's being done about it. And nothing has been done about it and it's still the same and actually it's worse than what it was. No matter where you live, no matter where you go, you're gonna have some kind of a rock quarry, some form of a mine. Good example, the Cadman mine, which used to be uh, Pacific Rock Products, they enclosed that. Their issues and troubles went right down the tubes. They don't have any issues anymore. They don't have any complaints like they used to because it's all inside. It's, it's quiet for the neighbors. The neighbors don't have to worry about it. They had issues with the trucks. They put a, another lane going up the hill out of there, which solved the problem. There's some specifics, and then there's also sort of the spirit of thing. If you, if you read what the then hearing examiner for the, in 2004, I guess, when I wrote it, there were a lot of issues that that hearing examiner didn't think he could get his arms around. I mean, things about water quality, groundwater, noise, dust, uh, transportation issues. And so he put a great deal of weight on 
the creation of a neighborhood advisory group to work with county and with the, the operator. So on an ongoing basis, these things, could, as, they, as the quarry developed, could be better understood and better dealt with. Well, that neighborhood advisory committee, which was the key to the, the whole operation of the conditional use permit, they haven't met for years. It haven't been in existence for years, probably over a decade. The other part is you can go through this whole long list of everything that's supposed to be in the conditional use permit. If you're a mere mortal, it's almost impossible to find out what in the heck's happened. Are they, and so <laughs> when you have a situation where you know that some of the rules are being violated, it's kind of natural. You make the assumption, you start asking the question, are they all being violated? There's no place you can go and find out how many truckloads per hour. You know how many they're supposed to be limited to, but you, there's no amount of that. There's, there's a limit on how much noise they can generate at the property line, all that kind of business, but there's no place you can go to find out how much noise is generated. They may be in compliance, but as I say, you don't know because there's no, no way to pull, go find out. When you're as hassled as some of the people up there are, up there being, you know, Gabriel Road, Kelly Road, you assume the worst after a while. You say they must, you know, the devils must be violating them all. It's frustrating learning about living near a quarry after you've moved in. We all felt when we moved here, we, we found this gem hidden from the rest of the world. It's a beautiful area, recreation area with the, with the falls and the river and the trees and the peaceful environment. And then to have that peace and quiet broken by truck after truck, sounds like a freight train coming through your front yard. People could say, well, you should have done your homework. You should have looked it up. You should have learn more about it but you know things like that aren't disclosed um, homeowners don't want to disclose that stuff because they want to get the maximum value for their home quite frankly at the time we moved in the activity wasn't nearly as much as it is now in the forums they've talked about you know taking actions so that people are more aware of, of the quarry and that um, when people consider moving this area they're concerned about that I would caution the county about taking any actions that would diminish current homeowners value by doing something that you know, would have a negative impact on the people that live here now. And there's a lot of people whose ret retirements are tied up in their homes. Officially making, uh, declaring something, a, a quarry zone could have a negative impact for those of us who currently live here. There are things that the quarry operator can do to be a better neighbor. They could uh, do adopt, adopt the road programs where they can help pick up trash that litter the roads to and from the quarry. Right now, the operator is virtually an outsider. They're not a neighbor. They can be more involved in community events. This area is unique. They say that in the third congressional district, which is what that area is, they made $2.17 billion on recreation last year. So recreation is important. I think we need to think about that and how we're going to manage our rural areas so that everyone can feel comfortable uh, putting their life savings in homes and not have to worry about, you know, blasting and groundwater contamination. And I just think it's important that the livability of that area be enhanced just because it's going to be an irreplaceable asset to everyone in the long term. I think it's moving in the right direction. I have spoken to a couple people at Clark County. They are extremely aware of the issue. They are the ones that pulled these meetings together, which made me really happy. The examiner hearing was a little difficult to sit through for the mining permit. But other than that, I think that everyone is wanting to come to the table to talk about these issues. Again, it gets back to the quality of life in the county. And again, we want to prosper or thrive and grow, but there's a, a smarter way to do it. That means doing things differently than, than what we've done in the past. And it's going to require everybody working together. I've seen bad things happen in different areas of the West, so I've got a yardstick to go by. It's not too late here. It's going to cost a little more, but now is the time to make some really smart, productive changes that, that have long range implications, but we gotta do it now. We can't keep talking about it. 
My view on the steps the county has taken recently is that they're putting a good foot forward. What's, what's kind of stunning is that now for well more than a decade, perhaps it's up to 15 or 17 years, if you look at the concerns that residents had back then, at the onset of the mining operations, they're the same exact issues we're dealing with today. So these things haven't gone away. The county never should have approved the mining. The lands hearing examiner back in the day was in opposition. The neighbors were, and they turned a deaf ear and a blind eye to that. It was socially irresponsible of the county to do that. So how are we gonna fix it? Well now, since the initiation of that surface mine overlay at Yakko Mountain, the community has grown. More and more houses have been built. So if it was a problem then, it's only been ex greatly exasperated today. And so it's time to face the music and say that the Yakko Mountain Quarry is no longer congruent with the other uses that preceded it in the surrounding area and the mine should cease. That aside, right, we need aggregate. Believe me, I know we, we need rock. I just had a couple of loads delivered, I use rock. The question is we need to be able to extract minerals in a way that's congruent with other land uses. And right now we have a gross mismatch. We can be creative in our thinking, and if we just use a speck of imagination, we might realize that there are rock sources that are located in areas that will not create the fracas that the, that the Yakult Mountain Quarry has with respect to disruption of people's lives and environmental consequences. It can't be us and them. It has to be all of this in this together, and we have to come up with a solution because the opposition is going to get us nowhere. I don't think the quarry is going to go away. It's here. It shouldn't be here, but it's here. The end point is not they're gone. The end point, I think, is that they're going to have to operate differently, and they're going to have to operate more responsibly, and they're going to have to somehow be a lot more sensitive to and find solutions to the people up there. I mean, I'm sitting here, and I have to say, personally, on a day-to-day -day basis, for what's happening now, I'm not aggravated or impacted very much. When you talk to Mark and some of those other people that are up there, it's, I, I mean, it is every darn day. How that all ends up and how much, you know, the misery can be taken care of for some of those people, I don't know, but we need to start moving in that direction and be, creatively see if we can't find out. My hope is that through this forum, the county and the operators and, and neighborhoods like ours could learn to work together and, and that quarries and neighbors could coexist. A best case outcome is where the, the residents and the industry can work and live in concert. And that means that they're both understand the value and viability of the mining operation and the need to continue that work and understand the concerns and are mindful of the concerns and mitigate the concerns of the folks living in those areas to the greatest extent possible. My advice would be to communicate with each other for success. If your intention is to bring a concern to the attention of the mine operators, do that directly and as quickly as possible. We know them, the ones we've worked with and the people that are responsive to the SMAC invitations and so forth, to be interested in solving those problems as well. And they appreciate that open, transparent conversation. I think my advice to everyone involved in the conversation is let's have a civil conversation. Let's talk rationally with each other face to face about what our differences are, what our opinions are, what our thoughts are. Let's study the issue. Let's figure out what the, the factual data looks like. Let's talk about finding our common ground. I don't want to say I doubt what people say, but at the same time I also believe in the people that go to work for our members all the time. As a kid, I, I'd see my dad come home and he'd be exhausted. He'd sit through public hearings, he'd be out in the rock pit, and it was an exhaustive effort to create what we have today. And I want to continue that. I think we're good at what we do. We've come a very long way. We've outmatched and outlasted some global mining companies. We're a family-run business. I got my grandpa, I have my dad, my uncle, and I have seven cousins. We all work within the company. And I think my grandpa's very proud of that. I think my uncle and dad are very proud of that. Once you get good at something, you might as well continue because you might go try to do something else and realize you're not any good at doing that. The construction industry is made up of families and kids and generations of people that 
rely on what we do every day. The people that are affected by what I do for a living, uh, that bothers me, but it's an everyday life. I mean, you deal with all types of adversities and things that you'd rather not have to deal with if you had a choice. I know I do, I know my family does, I know everybody does, but if, if, if everybody, everybody would take a step back and realize that there's a lot that goes on in this world that doesn't necessarily always involve everybody's feelings, I think people can have a lot more realistic expectations and conversations going forward. And if you can put yourself in the other person's shoes and work towards a solution that you can both live with or hell, even both be satisfied with, let's work towards that. Find some common ground with people and understand why they're doing what they're doing, the need they're providing to other people. And I'll be the first one to say that I'll put myself in your shoes. I'd like to see what you're experiencing and I'd like to do whatever I can to help that or to facilitate something that's more comfortable for you going forward. But it has to be a two-way street, you know? It can't just be, you're ruining my life, I want you to go away, let's have a conversation. I'm hoping we can get a good rapport with the store dolls but they're gonna have to step up to the plate like we are, and they're gonna have to realize that there's issues and they need to address them and they need to take care of them. That's about all I can say. <laughs> well, anything else you wanna add? Or I think that was good. No, I think that'll be about it. Show. Sure.